Welcome to Perspectives El Paso. I'm Professor Leon Blevins of El Paso Community College Television. You've heard me say many times that my style of interviewing is kind of like Forrest Gump. A relative asked me one time about what my style was, and that's what I said, it's like Forrest Gump. I'm sitting down at some table, say in a restaurant or something, and someone sits down next to me, or it's at a park bench and somebody sits down next to me, and I engage them in conversation. And here we are in friendly Texas and the friendly southern area of our country, and we don't feel afraid to sometimes engage others in conversation. Well, here's another one of those stories. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, my wife and I were at the Barnes & Noble store in the Fountains Shopping Center, and we picked up a book there, and when the clerk ran out the receipt, he said, this receipt shows if you will go over here to Starbucks in store that you get a free cookie if you buy a cookie. My wife is addicted. My wife, Shanna, is addicted, definitely, to Starbucks coffee. And I said, okay, let's go do that. So we went over sat down at a little table, she on one side, I know on the other, and in a few minutes here come a couple of ladies and they sit down, one by me and one across next to my wife. The lady sitting next to me looks at me and says, oh, I know you, I know you. Uh, uh, I said, I'm Leon Blevins, I have a television sh show. And she says, oh, well, look, look, you're in my phone. I said, how did I get in your phone? And I, it was his Uncle Sam. And she said, no, look, look, and she showed me. And there I was at Chopin at the Chopin Music Festival because my guest today, Rosario Clude, loves music. And we became acquainted and talked a while. And she told so many interesting stories about being a Filipino American, spending a lot of early time in El Paso, Texas, that I asked her if she would be on my TV show. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thank I'm you for inviting me. I'm glad we crossed paths at Starbucks. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now then, I remember you told us when you were sitting there, you were sitting there with your sister. Yes. She didn't talk much. We carried on most of the conversation with you. And you mentioned that you were spelling bee champion at the age of 13 in 1960. Yes, I was. So I went on the internet when I got home and there was your picture in the El Paso Herald Post being given that award. Wasn't that an exciting thing to happen in your life? Well, my goodness, I was really, uh, I was really very surprised that I had won because when I went to school, we always had this very intelligent girl and uh, she won it for the school in the fourth grade and the fifth grade. And then I decided uh, in the sixth grade, our teacher encouraged us uh, to try to, uh, you know, read that, uh, that book to try to, uh, find out what all those uh, words were and so forth. So I decided, okay, good, I'll try it. I said, well, um, if Eileen can do it, then maybe I can do it too, you know? <laughs> so that's how I got interested in the spelling bee, and he was also a very good tutor. That was in the sixth grade, um, Mr. Tui. But um, uh, I did not uh, compete in the sixth grade in the spelling bee uh, because Eileen was there. But then I decided, uh, when I'm in the seventh grade, and Eileen is not in the same school, <laughs> okay, well, I went to McGoffin, and I decided, okay, well, maybe this is my chance, because then I can compete against Eileen if she wins uh, uh, for Cross V School. And there, voila, I won it for the school. So mm -hmm. uh, my parents were very happy, and uh, then I got to compete at the El Paso um, high school and got first place and the biggest uh, prize was the trip to Washington DC to be a contestant in the National Spelling Bee. Wow. And then I also got a set of uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. Students today don't know what encyclopedias are. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well I still have them and I still use them. Now you discussed that some of this also then got you into journalism. Yes. Got you into teaching and got you into journalism and writing even here in El Paso, for the Herald Post? No, I, I, uh, I worked for the El Paso Times. The El Paso Times? Yes. And uh, the reason why I got interested in, uh, in journalism is because I loved uh, Superman uh, comic books, you know, Clark Kent and mm -hmm. Lois Lane. Mm -hmm. And so I knew already when I was 12 years old, I'm going to be a, a reporter. I'm going to be a journalist. <laughs> yeah, I, I pursued this uh, because I liked uh, languages mm -hmm. and I was good in English and so forth. And uh, I could write a little bit, and so this is what I pursued uh, in high school and then later on in college at UTEP. 
Now, you grew up in northeast El Paso. Yes, uh, I, we grew up uh, in northeast El Paso, and that used to be real barren uh, back in the 1955. Uh, mm -hmm. And we got to northeast El Paso because my dad was a military man. He was uh, in the American um, Army. Now, you're Filipino-American. Yes, we're Filipino-American. Okay. That means uh, my dad um, joined the um, forces when he was 19 years old. He joined the, the Philippine Scouts, mm -hmm. okay? And later on when he had to go to war, well, the Philippine Scouts were turned over t as uh, American, uh, uh, mili uh, American military soldiers. Mm -hmm. So yes, my dad uh, was one of the survivors of the Bataan uh, War. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, when we were growing up, he hardly spoke about it because of the, you know, atrocities of the Bataan War. Yeah, well, in like 1972, this. when I came to teach here, most of the students were coming in, they were coming back from Vietnam War, but some had fought in World War II, and some in Korea, and some in Vietnam, three-timers, we call them. And they had some interesting story to tell, those that were willing to tell some of them, some that just couldn't talk about them. Now, did you marry a military man? Well, I married a German military man. <laughs> he was, uh, well, you know, Fort Bliss uh, takes care of uh, people from NATO, right. and ha they have, uh, uh, you know, different uh, countries um, trying to learn uh, things about rocket and rocket scient uh, science and so forth. So I met my uh, husband, who was a, in the German Air Force. <laughs> yes, we became uh, an air defense military right. base. Exactly. Today we're more heavy armored, but back earlier we were cavalry, mm -hmm. and then we became air defense. Yes. Uh, tell us a little bit about your days in that situation. You, you then went to Germany, didn't you? Yes. Uh, well, uh, I worked uh, uh, a few years at the El Paso Times. Mm -hmm. I had a wonderful time, and uh, uh, yeah, my mentor was uh, Barbara Funkhauser who later became the editor of, of the El Paso Times. Mm -hmm. She taught me a lot of things, and uh, uh, if I would write something and I wasn't sure uh, if, if that would be acceptable or what she thought about it, she said, well, they called me Rosie at the, at the Times. She said, well, Rosie, I wouldn't say it this way. I said, well, why not? This is, this is my expression. Well, you know, uh, try to put a, a different angle to it. So these are the kinds of tips that she gave me. But, uh, uh, but she said, but go ahead and write what, what you think is correct, but maybe try to put a little, uh, you know, angle so that uh, it'll be more um, uh, educational. Didn't you hear, make shorter paragraphs and shorter sentences, tighten it up? Yeah, you know, it, it, it's, it's uh, like a pyramid, mm -hmm. you know, the most important things at the top, and then you get, uh, uh, you know, sh uh, smaller and smaller, which are, you know, they're not so important. That's the, that's the journalism uh, way to, uh, style of uh, writing things, you know. You are currently historian for the American Philippine Society in El Paso. Yes, yes, I am. Um, the Filipino uh, Americans uh, formed this uh, Philippine Association, Filipino American Association of El Paso in 1971. And this was a group of people uh, who decided, uh, you know what, uh, we live here and we're proud of our heritage and our culture and we should do something about it. So my parents were uh, charter members and in 1971, they decided to uh, really uh, continue with this idea, having a, an association to um, have uh, yearly uh, uh, feasts or yearly parties, celebrations, mm -hmm. uh, to honor our Philippine uh, heritage. So at these parties, uh, there would be, you know, at the Marriott or whatever hotel, was available, they would have, um, uh, you know, a dinner, and then afterwards a dance, and then they would have entertainment. And part of the entertainment would be like the traditional Philippine dances, like the tinikling, mm -hmm. or else these uh, uh, traditional uh, folk folklore uh, dances in in the in the native costumes. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Do you have a building that houses the association, or you just operate out of people's homes? No, no. Uh, we uh, we usually uh, meet at the Underwood uh, Golf uh, Complex because it's uh, very central. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to go to the east because we live mostly in the northeast. Right. As I said, uh, <coughs> the Filipinos, um, my parents are one of the pioneer Filipino Americans here in El Paso. Uh, they came, uh, my, my dad came first in 1948 on his way to Alabama for a course there, for a sergeant major's course. Uh, they made a big deal uh, of it. I think there were five or six in the Alabama newspaper there. Mm -hmm. So upon uh, uh, finishing that course, uh, he was uh, required to go back to the Philippines but in 1952, he was reassigned to uh, Fort Bliss, and that's when he brought his family over. So we've uh, been here really since 1952, the family. But uh, we know uh, that there were two Filipino-American families who were here uh, earlier than we were. And uh, if you know uh, Manila Street in Northeast El Paso, mm -hmm. that used to be like nothing. There was this Philippine, uh, family there, uh, their name is Edquid, and they live in a house, and they, and they made it like a, a farmhouse. They had, I think, uh, some pigs and some chickens, and I remember as a little girl when there would be some kind of a party, and the parties would be like a baptism or a birthday celebration, we'd all go over there, and then they would have a, uh, a cookout, like a lichun, so I remember that. And when they moved away and they made that section of uh, El Paso as part of the town, uh, he asked them to name it Manila. Instead of his name, he said, name it Manila. Oh, that's okay, good. yes. And the family moved to Florida. And, uh, and the Sabalas who were here, uh, well, they're both deceased now, but uh, they were here uh, they were here, and these also became uh, our very good friends. And uh, these are, these are also the godparents uh, uh, to my uh, s uh, sister Mary Jane. Yeah. Let me ask you about collection of items. Mm -hmm. You're the historian. Do you convince some people to give you and your association some of their memorabilia, not all of it to their families, but some for your association, so some of those are memories that do stay in El Paso. Yeah, well, uh, they have not given me, uh, you know, objects or memorabilia. They have given me um, uh, news and uh, uh, letters and things like this. Okay. And then I have documented this with my telephone, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes, and then uh, some, and, uh, our last uh, 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 gala event was in October, and so I, all these pictures that I had, we put them on a, you know, on PowerPoint. this loop, yeah, this PowerPoint, and so that people will know who were the who were these people who really started the Filipino American Association, mm -hmm. so that uh, you know their names will not die out. Right. So I, that, that, that's that's my idea. Okay. At some point, did you serve as president of the the group, and now you're historian? No, no, I'm uh, I'm still historian, and uh, we just had elections. Now I'm the second vice president. Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. And also uh, chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. So. Uh, I go around uh, soliciting donations for uh, our uh, uh, diverse uh, festivities so that we can have a raffle. And with the money from the raffle, we uh, have a scholarship fund so that we can uh, honor uh, a deserving uh, student uh, to go to the college of his choice, you know, with our scholarship fund. And we also uh, donate to three charities in El Paso. With our with the money that we uh, that uh, you know we earn through the raffles, yeah. isn't it often assumed that you are Hispanic, that you're Mexican American, and people don't realize you're Philippine? Yeah, American. well, we are not Mexican Americans. We I have a Spanish name, and uh, maybe ninety percent of the Filipinos have Spanish names mm -hmm. because uh, we used to belong to uh, Spain right. until eighteen ninety eight. Okay, yes, and uh, that's why uh, even uh, we're mostly Catholics, okay, uh, and uh, we follow this Catholic faith and uh, everything that uh, is uh, 
uh, you know, synonymous with Spain, uh, we also uh, pursued in our lives. Now, probably some of your Filipino American young people marry someone who is Hispanic, and you begin to see amalgamation of this, and that always happens in any time that you have a small population and a larger population that is very similar in nature, such as language, religion, and so on. Yes, well, this is just uh, human nature. Mm -hmm. You're just going to go, maybe uh, you're attracted to somebody who's uh, more like you, okay? You might have the same uh, family traditions, you might have the same uh, faith, and maybe some of your customs are similar. And that's why, you know, it's, uh, it's just human nature. Yeah. Was there any conversation among your family members about you marrying a German? Well, uh, the thing is, uh, there was an influx of Germans since 1958 at Fort Bliss. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do play tennis, and I had some tennis friends who were Germans. And, uh, you know, they introduce you to, to other friends. You so. know, that's what's wonderful about El Paso. <laughs> we don't make the big issue about the ethnicity. No, it's so. We make the, <laughs> the, the differentiation of what can you do and what we have fun doing it. Right, it's so multi-international. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it, right. Well, I've had some Middle Eastern students that were harassed and bullied in other parts of the country, and they changed El Paso to go to college because they blended in easier with their skin tones and things like that than they did in Kansas or East Texas or someplace like that. Mm -hmm. and, and I like that aspect of El Paso, that we're much more open to different cultures, languages, and things. Well, in fact, when I was in college, uh, we had started this international students organization and I was one of the five, you know, we represented uh, the five uh, areas of the world. And uh, of course, uh, you know, the, the Jews and the Middle Easterners uh, were never uh, friendly with each other, but uh, I had, uh, I was very intent of bringing these people together at one table and eating together with brotherly love. Mm -hmm. So I always uh, say that uh, that's one of, uh, you know, one of my highlights in uh, college is that I got, uh, um, you know, uh, Aziz and Yoram together to be friends and everybody brought their own kind of food. So uh -huh. if they ate with their fingers, who cares? Mm -hmm. And if they ate like this, it doesn't matter. We all ate together at one table and we all shared, uh, the discussion together, and we were all uh, uh, we were brothers and sisters. Well, you and I are. And so this is this is already. Uh, uh, remember, I graduated in 1968. This is a back in 67. Okay. Okay. Well, you and I are simpatico. I helped set up the first international relations conference. Well, yes. At Wayland Baptist College, it was held about 1960, I think it was. So I'm very much internationalist in scope. Yeah. <laughs> not isolationist. Not America only but very much yes. drawing upon other cultures and languages and foods. Yes, well see, this is, a, well, this is part of the education. Like uh, I could speak for myself that uh, one of my uh, biggest projects when I was uh, working on a master's was to uh, uh, work on the five uh, poverty uh, areas of the world. So when you start working on these five poverty areas of the world, then you get to you get to know the culture of poverty, the culture of the people, and the, just the culture of internationalism, mm -hmm. things like this. And, uh, and uh, well, this is what uh, education uh, brings you. You know, you start uh, uh, asking questions and you want to find out uh, the answer, so you start digging in this Encyclopedia Britannica, right. <laughs> things like this, and uh, yes, it's, uh, we, we've always, I guess I'm like you, we've always been very interested in our, in, in, the, in the world, right? Well, my first impression of the Philippines was World War II, mm -hmm. and I had a cousin, lived not far from us, he was uh, several years older than I, went into the war, and they sent him to the Philippines, and he died at Luzon. Mm -hmm. And just recently I came across a couple of pictures of him that he had mailed back to my parents. And I went to the internet and I tracked down his brother in Bellingham, Washington, and let him know I was going to send him those pictures of his brother 
that my children would have no interest in who that is. But to him, it's his brother. My next thinking about the Philippines was at Wayland Baptist College. And there was a fellow in a class that I was taking. Named, his last name was Septien. Septien. Don't remember his first name. I'd have to look in the College Angel to see what it is. But I was always fascinated with uh, some of these things that uh, and people going. And then I uh, worked in churches and sometimes missionaries who had gone as Christian missionaries to the Philippines and would come back and tell their stories. One of our friends we went to church with, uh, she went to the Philippines with her husband and she became a midwife delivering babies. And I think she may be on Facebook with my wife. And so when they were back here for a fundraiser one time, I bought a Filipino hat, kind of a brimmed hat, a kind of a straw looking thing. And I've worn it at several different functions. But it's just a smattering of information. I've never researched deeply. I do know some of the history of the Philippines and some of their political system. But there's just so much in the world out there to know we can't know it all. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I said before, uh, our family came here in the early 50s. And then soon after that, a lot of Filipino-American families, mostly through the military, also settled down in Northeast El Paso. So that's where uh, Northeast El Paso was uh, where the Filipino-Americans uh, started out and, uh, um, you know, continued their uh, living here in, in El Paso. And soon after that, uh, like in uh, the end of the 70s, then the, the health field, the doctors and nurses came. And now uh, you must realize that uh, the nurses are very admired throughout the world. Oh, yes. See, now I didn't know this, well, until I lived in Germany. And uh, I was playing tennis one day, and uh, this uh, girl who was uh, studying to be a nurse, she said, hey, Rosario, we have 13 Filipino nurses uh, who just came uh, to uh, our um, hospital. I said, well, uh, bring them over so I can meet them. I said, okay, good. Well, they are very loved all over the world. They're in Saudi Arabia, they're in, uh, they're in Canada. As I said, they are in, in, in Germany. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they hardly have any problem trying to get their, um, their work permits because they are nurses, right. okay? Things like this, and uh, yes, and today you can see all the nurses and doctors here in, in El Paso. Who were some of the major mentors besides your parents? Well, um, you know, I, I love going to school, and uh, even if I were sick, then I said, oh, I wanna go to school, and my mother would say, you've got a fever and you're going to stay home, so okay. Then I said, okay, but I can go to school tomorrow. But uh, the thing is, I guess uh, a lot of people thought I was weird. But I loved going to school because then uh, I loved listening to my teachers. And uh, I still know them. Um, Mrs. Seals from the second grade. And um, from the fourth grade, um, um, Mrs. Fuller and Mrs. Meesday from the fifth grade, Mr. Tui from the sixth grade. Well, that's amazing you can remember <laughs> all of those that far back. In the seventh grade, Mrs. Uh, Fuentes and, and so forth. Now in high school, um, my English teacher, because I love English, and uh, you know, she made us memorize a lot of things. And one of the things that she made us memorize was the prologue to the Canterbury Tales. Oh so then, okay, it, uh, it wasn't very difficult for me to memorize it, but I could use that. Years later, when I was teaching uh, adult uh, English in Germany, and the Germans had uh, learned English uh, in school, but what the English that they uh, learn is uh, British English. Right. And so then uh, there was this one uh, man there one time, and they said, oh, Mrs. Kluder, the English you're teaching us is just pidgin English. You know, it's just uh, derogatory for, yeah. Yeah. Uh, for English, pidgin English. I said, well, what do you mean? Uh, he said, well, you know, the English, you're, uh, you're, you're speaking English like a cowboy with uh, chewing gum, okay? <laughs> this is how you speak English. I said, well, I said, if you want to hear British English, I can also give you some examples of British English. Well, yeah, well, show me, you know, he was oh, showing good. off. So I decided, okay, good. I was really frustrated and getting angry. I said, okay, now listen to this. I said, 
I guess you know Chaucer because you said uh, you studied a little bit of uh, English and so forth. Yeah, he does. Okay, well, just listen to me. So I recited the prologue to the Canterbury Tales. <laughs> I'm telling you, that guy did not say one word. He didn't come the next week, but uh, the week after that, he came there with a bouquet of flowers. Oh. He was so embarrassed. He was <laughs> embarrassed that he would uh, try to uh, question my um, my intelligence, yeah, I your guess. Abilities, right? Yeah. yeah. So that was, uh, and I said to myself, I came home. I said to my husband, "Thank God." Mary Yates made me memorize all these things, you know. <laughs> yeah, those are... Uh, Caused you to get a bouquet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, and, uh, well, he was very respectful, and, of, of course, the whole class. Now, remember, these are men who are CEOs for this company. Mm -hmm. I taught mostly the CEOs, like from uh, Beck's Beer, um, uh, the Coffee Aducho, for Coca-Cola, for an engineering company, things like this. Mm -hmm. So they are not... Uh, you know, very intelligent people, but of course, you know, sometimes they think that they have the upper hand. No, not with me, okay? <laughs> I know my English, right? <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Yates, okay. Oh, that's great. What are some of your grandest memories, your crystal moments in your career from saying be out in Northeast El Paso and the spelling bee and up to now? Oh, I love playing tennis and, um, um, and I had a very, very nice uh, coach, Dalton Hill. And one day I was, um, my nephew started uh, playing tennis and sometimes uh, his mother couldn't pick him up. So, so I said, okay, good, I'll pick up uh, Brandon. And this is at uh, Trans Mountain Tennis Courts over there. Mm -hmm. And one day uh, I dropped something on the floor, uh, on, the, on the cement there, on the patio. And then I said to my sister, Karen, the one you met, I said, Karen, uh, um, see where I dropped that thing. And then while we were looking, she said, hey, Rosario, your name is here, you know? I said, what is it? So I looked up, okay. Now the thing is, um, Van Hill, the son of Coach Hill, had donated uh, some money to build that uh, tennis court mm -hmm. over there at Trans Mountain. And uh, because of this, he had honored all the uh, tennis uh, people in the, from just say from 1963 to 1972. So your name was on a brick. Right, was on a brick. <laughs> so I was very, uh, I was very surprised, and I had asked the, uh, the then uh, director over there. I said, "Well, what's this here?" I said, "Well, how much did he donate?" Oh, we can't say that, you know. But I mean to say, I thought that was uh, wonderful from Coach Hill and from Van Hill, wow. because he knew that uh, you know all his all his. Uh, tennis uh, students, uh, they, uh, well, they love tennis. They love tennis. We had to play maybe like 10 hours a day. Well, not really, but. Uh, well, it sounds like a, a deserved honor to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you but, ended up with your name on a brick. Okay. Yeah. You're the only person I've interviewed that I know that has a name on a brick. Oh, really? And thanks for being with us today. <laughs> Thank you very much. And those of you in television land, thanks for tuning in and watching another informative and educational program with Rosario Clute. Thank you very much. Thank you.